What's up, guys? Coach Simmons here. Super excited to sit down with you guys for this episode. Uh, we're sitting down with Amanda McCarthy, uh, and she's going to share all about the Running Athlete Clinic. This is part of a children's hospital's special program that they have uh, for high school and young adult uh, runners. Uh, so everything from biomechanics to blood work, nutrition, dietetics, all of those things. So if you're a runner and you're someone that's been struggling with a bone stress injury, trying to better understand some of your fatigue, um, or maybe struggling through uh, an injury uh, that isn't bone related, um, we have some great resources for you that I'll put inside this episode. Um, but this was a super fast episode. I sat down with Amanda McCarthy and we talked a lot about blood values and the importance of not only iron, but also ferritin, where we can get it, what some of our favorite supplements are, uh, and just some good patterns of behavior that I think that uh, if you're someone that's struggling with fatigue, um, feeling like the training isn't quite clicking and you're not seeing those improvements and you have a lot of associated fatigue, this is going to be a really great episode, super educational, um, but also have some great resources for you if you feel like you're stuck and are looking for a place to go, someone that can help you out. So let's dive into this episode with Amanda McCarthy. All right, Amanda, thank you so much for hopping on with me today. Um, Amanda, we went through your whole title at the start of this. I'm still trying to pull it all together here. Program Coordinator of Sports Nutrition at Children's Hospital Colorado. Um, right. You've worked with a number of our athletes over the years uh, for different aspects, ranging from sports nutrition um, uh, and many different avenues of that, as well as biomechanics and a number of other things. So I wanted to have you on today to talk a little bit about uh, the track program that you guys have. Uh, it's an acronym, uh, as well as talk and kind of dig into the iron ferritin and kind of kind of talk about blood a little bit. We're not quite at Halloween, but uh, we're we're getting close. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm happy to tell you a little bit more about my role in the track program. And so um, my role as the program coordinator for sports nutrition, I see athletes one on one um, at our clinics. And so when an athlete is struggling with maybe low iron, maybe anemia, maybe a, a bone stress injury, they may come see our providers and then get referred to me to work on the nutritional aspects um, that are that are implicated with each of those diagnoses. And so I'm kind of working one-on-one -on -one with athletes. And I think what's special about my role is as a dietitian, I care very much about the athlete's health and normal growth and meeting their nutrition needs. But as a sports dietitian, I also um, take into account the athletic component of that and when timing of nutrition is going to best um, benefit the athlete based on the, the training schedules that they do have. Um, so I work in that one-on-one -on -one role. I also come out and do team talks for a lot of our partners as well um, for educational purposes. And then I do a kind of a, a mixed bag of research and planning and partnership development um, within children's as well. With our track program, that's one of the clinics that I work in. It's, it stands for the Running Athlete Clinic. So we see cross-country runners, we see actual like track runners, we see soccer players, basketball players, people that have running as a, a mainstay in their sport. Um, and they get to see Dr. Armento, who is our running nutrition or our running medicine doctor, and then myself as the sports dietitian together in the visit. So it's really nice because Dr. Armento will see the athlete first and be able to discuss kind of what the what the main concern is. We do a little debrief in between her visit and my visit, and then I go in and see the athlete, and then we debrief again. And so it makes um, coordination of care very, very seamless in that we're able to stay on the same page with the athlete and express the concerns that we have, and then tie in what the diagnosis is from her standpoint with what I'm seeing from a nutritional standpoint and be able to address both of, both of those things in one visit. When working with that uh, program, is this something that's insurance based? Is this out of out of pocket? Um, how does how does that process work? Yeah, so we do accept insurance, and so um, there. I don't have our number directly in front of me, but you can call our our running athlete clinic if you go, if you type in that with Children's Hospital Colorado, our page will pop up, um, and there's a phone number that you can call and schedule. You'll schedule one visit. Again, it would be both of us, but we do take insurance, so. Um, whether or not, not your insurance covers would be something you'd have to check with each individual plan, but it is insurance based. That's awesome. And I think it's, uh, something of its own kind. Um, you know, normally that would have to be 
you know, go one place to talk about biomechanics or what we're seeing there to then have a separate nutritionist, which more and more nutritionists um, are becoming available and working with runners. But it is a specific thing, uh, not just looking at it from a standpoint of are you eating enough? It's also what's the quality and density of the nutrients that are there, because one of the things you talked about was bone stress injuries. Um, and I know today we want to talk a little bit about the blood side of things and how important that is. Um, because a big portion of the people that you work with are going through a major stage of growth and development. Um, and so a very young body, um, you know, is going to respond to training differently, um, than an older body, uh, especially one that's growing. Um, sleep is a component, you know, nutrition's a huge component, but when we talk about the blood part of this, um, and I know it can seem a little icky, uh, for those, uh, but the reality is, is that, um, we have minerals and lots of different things. We've talked a lot about electrolytes in the past, past couple of weeks, especially on this podcast. One of the things to consider in there is our iron level. And so for those that are uninitiated, I know people are like, okay, we have iron in our blood. Help me understand that. Like, can you give me a quick breakdown of iron versus ferritin? Yeah, totally. So when we think of iron by itself, like we can measure serum iron, which is literally the amount of, of iron, the mineral floating around in our bloodstream, right? Um, so we can measure that, that becomes more transient based on what our diet looks like from day to day, how much absorption of iron we're getting, um, in any moment. Um, we also have ferritin, which is a storage form of iron. So that is what your body is saving in case you have these really big bouts. I mean, for runners, let's say you go to the mountains and you do a really hard effort or you're going on, uh, you know, a three day running vacation or a week running vacation, right? So those extra iron stores are available for our body to top, tap into in times of excess demand. So going to altitude is going to cause excess demand because the oxygen level is lower in the air. And so we want to have more hemoglobin available or more iron available for that. Um, I guess I should define hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the actual um, iron containing protein that's attached to our red blood cells. And so we take that iron that we're intaking, we can use that to create hemoglobin and hemoglobin is what actually attacks, attaches oxygen and then carries it to all of our working cells in the body. Um, but in, an, in a high altitude environment, we need higher iron stores to be able to, um, adapt to that altitude. Um, and then if we're going to be exercising in that altitude, we can go through those stores relatively quickly. And so it's important to make sure that we have a good number of stores, iron stores um, in the body to be able to accommodate for that. So that's that ferritin number. And is that why we might see some athletes be quote unquote altitude non-adopters non versus adopters that would go up to altitude training for a training stint? They may not be able to do that physiologically as efficiently. Yeah, totally. Right. So um, if you're going into a high altitude state with low ferritin, that's going to feel incredibly difficult and be a lot harder to adapt to versus if you're iron replete and we have really good ferritin stores, your body's going to going to adapt to that altitude a lot easier. It doesn't mean it'll feel any easier, but the physiological response will be better. So for the athletes, because I know the ones that are going to be listening to this are thinking, OK, I've lived here my whole life. Um, you know, why now am I, am I feeling not great? You know, I had a summer that felt like good training and now that I'm racing a lot more, I'm really feeling exhausted. I'm not, you know, like it seems like some of the common signs are a lack of recovery, you know, exhaustion, kind of that, uh, you know, and again, this is my personal feeling. It's kind of like when you have low blood pressure and you stand up too fast and you kind of get that lightheaded kind of feeling, you know, those are the signs that when I get those as a coach, I'm saying, Ooh, we need to check your ferritin levels. We need to check your iron levels. Um, so what is happening there for people that normally live here have not had an issue. And all of a sudden it's like, Whoa, you know, on the female side, maybe they're, you know, just starting their period, um, for the first time or they're in their first couple of cycles. But even for men who don't get periods, if they're experiencing that, like in similar symptoms, what is, what's happening there? Yeah. So there could be a multitude of things, right? So number one, in a teen athlete, I always think about growth cycles. So if they're going through a growth cycle, they're using iron um, at a higher rate than they would if they were not growing. And so that could absolutely be part of it, that they're just going through the iron stores more quickly. Um, number two, if there's been any change in their nutrition intake, so maybe they've tried to eat more fruits and vegetables, maybe they're trying to raise their calcium intake, maybe they started drinking tea or coffee, 
all of those things can impact the bioavailability of iron and how much iron we're actually getting in our diet. Or I see a lot of athletes who are manipulating their food intake to lower their weight, which is not something I encourage athletes to do. But if they are doing that, they're lowering their iron intake there as well. Um, so all of those things can absolutely play a role. Um, and as you mentioned with menstruating females, uh, when they start their period, their iron needs go way up to like 18 milligrams of iron per day. Um, and so just as they're starting to get into that cycle, they're absolutely going to have more iron needs. So I, I typically see athletes doing pretty well, feeling pretty good. And then all of a sudden they're not feeling good. And so typically what I, um, what I assume happens during that time is iron stores have been adequate, but with the increase in training that they're having, we're just kind of like slowly ticking down on those iron stores until we get to a place where we actually have an inhibition of creating red blood cells efficiently, right? And then that's when we're starting to experience symptoms. We typically start seeing that happen as we get below a ferritin, that iron stores of 30. So we want absolutely to be above 30. And generally our target is closer to that like 50 level of ferritin, especially for us at altitude. We want to make sure those stores are adequate. So we do have that higher level of training. We go through a growth spurt. Our body's able to accommodate all of those things. Yeah. I've, I've said a number of like 50 to 80, especially for my longer distance runners, two milers, 5k athletes, um, you know, just with a long run and doing a lot of those other things, like you've got to be able to replenish those. And I think it's a no better time to kind of dig into that. When we think about replenishing those iron stores, um, you know, hemi iron, uh, being, you know, what you are able to get in from, you know, like red meat. Um, you know, I'm, I've been a vegetarian now 22 years. And so for me, don't eat meat. Um, you know, looking at a lot of other different iron stores, supplementation, let's kind of dig in to that. Like, how do we get it in our diet before we supplement? Because I'd rather see athletes try to get it naturally as much as they can. What are some great sources of iron, both, um, you know, that are, that are going to be meat-based and non-meat-based? Sure. Totally. Yeah. So, um, meat-based iron, the reason that meat is so promoted for iron is because the source of iron is the same as what it is in our body, right? So we absorb it directly. There's no conversion that needs to happen. It gets absorbed at a much higher rate than plant-based iron. So that's why needs are, are, um, not as high as vegetarian or vegan athletes. Um, and so any type of meat, so red meat, chicken, turkey, uh, fish, any of those would be good sources of what we call heme iron. However, when you look at the actual amount that's in those products, it's still relatively low, right? So like for a palm sized portion of meat, we're getting like two to three milligrams of iron out of that, which is good. But when you consider the amount of iron we need in a day, for teen athletes, it's about 15 milligrams per day. For female athletes, we're looking at closer to 18 milligrams per day. Um, and if they're going through a growth spurt and running and menstruating, it's likely even higher than that to be able to maintain those iron stores. We don't have exact numbers, but um, it's pretty high. So we need several high iron food sources throughout the day. Meat is just going to be one of those. Um, eggs, egg yolks also have a source of heme iron in them as well. So those are a good source. Um, and then other foods like whole grains, uh, green leafy vegetables, those have iron in them. Beans are a really good source of iron. Nuts and seeds have iron in them. We, we actually have quite a few foods that have iron, um, but we're talking about anywhere from like 0.5 to 2 milligrams per serving of these foods. So meeting adequate energy needs is going to be very important. Eating a wide variety of foods is going to be very important. Um, and then optimizing absorption through other foods that we can add in. So we know that getting good sources of vitamin C in our diet, especially with meals, is going to help to optimize iron absorption. So if you can add citrus to your meals, like oranges, grapefruits, lemons, limes, that's going to help absorb the iron that's already there. Um, and if you can avoid things that inhibit iron at meals, that's also helpful. So I mentioned coffee and tea. They're delicious. A, a lot of adults drink those. Hopefully kids aren't drinking them too much. But um, if we're drinking those with meals, that's going to limit iron absorption. High calcium foods also will limit iron absorption as well. Um, and that can be tricky because young athletes also have really high calcium needs too. So balancing those things can be tough for athletes. 
One other food I didn't mention on more of the vegetarian end of the spectrum is, is fortified cereals is probably one of my favorite foods to include for my young athletes, especially because their carb needs are so high and it has extra iron already added to it. And so I find that most of my athletes that do have really good ferritin stores are eating cereal on a relatively regular basis. So cereal's the superfood for high school athletes is what you're saying. Superfood, yeah. We can start marketing that. I would love to see that in the media. <laughs> I, uh, my dad, uh, was, uh, he worked for Kellogg's when I was a kid. So that's, uh, that's why I probably wasn't anemic as a kid is they got all those fortified nutrients. Um, no, this is great. This really, really digs into what we kind of wanted to, to talk through, you know, the, the low iron piece and the feelings and the symptoms that are there are often like fatigue. Um, I always get that lightheaded feeling. And then the, just like, I can't tap into like that next gear in my training, um, or I just don't have that same zap, uh, you know, and zip in my training. Um, and some of that could be fatigue. So again, this all goes back to, we talk a lot about journaling and kind of just monitoring. Um, you know, I say the idea that success leaves clues that when we journal and that we look at the bigger picture, uh, we can say, wow, I've really, you know, definitely been eating more food. Um, and kind of in the groups that you talked about there, um, and man, I'm starting to feel a lot better. When we talk about supplementation, I think, um, you know, there can be a lot of different things. Um, I've seen athletes have, do transfusions, which is usually when we're really low and we have to get from a, a, a pretty, you know, single digit to, you know, low teens number. Um, but then also like daily supplementation. Um, you know, can you talk briefly about those two things? Yeah, sure. So um, I would say generally where we're starting with athletes. So first of all, we always want to get blood work before we start any type of supplementation regimen. Um, iron is actually toxic to the body in high doses. And we have we have um, safeguards in place physiologically. So if we take in a big dose of iron orally from a supplement, our body actually increases a hormone that reduces our ability to absorb iron, which is fascinating and makes it super hard to increase iron uh, stores in the body sometimes, but it is toxic. So we don't ever just kind of willy nilly supplement iron. We always want to know what's going on in the body first um, so that we don't end up with iron overload. Um, so based on uh, an athlete's levels, we would start whatever supplementation needed as indicated there. We, I, I am always doing oral supplementation. Um, um, if we're getting to really low levels, that's when Dr. Armento would start to recommend going to see a hematologist or someone who can talk about the transfusion side of things. Um, but typically from an oral supplementation standpoint, we're starting with anywhere from 20 milligrams of elemental iron up to 65 or even 100 milligrams, which is real aggressive on an iron standpoint. And I'm talking about elemental iron. So you'll see lots of different versions of iron. There's ferrous gluconate, there's ferrous bisglycinate, there's... Um, ferrous sulfate out there on the market. Um, each of them have differences in their bioavailability, tolerance to the stomach. I will say one of the my favorites that I've been using recently is ferrous bis glycinate. Um, I'm seeing really nice improvements in iron with that. It gets absorbed very well, and it typically has lower side effects of like constipation, GI upset for my athletes. Um, but there's, there's lots of different ones on the market, but we're really looking at what is the elemental equivalent of iron in those supplements. Um, and again, I range from using as low as 20 milligrams to as high as hundred milligrams, just depending on how aggressive we need to be with athletes. And so in an athlete who, who consistently, um, like I have a collegiate athlete I'm thinking of, she consistently drops into the teens. She does regular transfusions because of that. Um, we're using a pretty aggressive oral iron supplement for her and also adjusting her diet because her iron absorption is so poor that we believe there's other dietary components that are contributing to that. Specifically, a low carbohydrate diet can also decrease iron um, bioavailability as well. So again, it's really dependent on the individual person and how we're going to address that and then what their specific numbers are. One thing um, I've had athletes or encouraged athletes to do is that maybe take their iron supplement in the evening and during bed so that if they do have stomach issues, um, I find that when athletes have, um, and again, this could be wrong, um, is that when they take it with breakfast, if it does give them stomach issues, it's, they are less likely to eat a full lunch. Um, so encouraging to take it before bed um, is a great way to not have those stomach issues. And then we're, we're able to keep our calories up and we're not like, Oh, I don't want to put anything on top of a stomach that already doesn't feel great. Yeah. Is there any issues with that? 
Yeah, um, there could be, but I would say generally that's good practice. If, if the stomach issues are inhibiting the ability to eat or inhibiting their willingness to take the iron, then taking it at night is a great option. Some re- some newer research is suggesting that iron is better absorbed in the morning than mm. it is at night. And so um, I would probably ask questions of the athlete and see like, are they getting an adequate breakfast? Are they taking the iron after they've had the breakfast? You know, so we could we could maybe identify some other things or maybe a different source of iron that might be a little well better tolerated. But again, we still will get absorption at night and every person is going to be different with that. And so if taking it at night is getting it into their body and we're seeing their numbers come up, then I have no problem with the athlete doing that. Love that. Um, And I really appreciate you taking some time to talk with me today. I know this was short and quick and we shoved a whole lot into this episode. Uh, But if people want to learn more about whether it's the track program or reach out to you, how can they get a hold of you guys? Yeah, if you look up Children's Hospital Colorado, the running athlete clinic, um, that will take you directly to our running athlete program. Um, Children's Hospital Colorado Sports Medicine Center also has lots of resources from our sports medicine primary care providers to myself within sports nutrition, um, to our physical therapists. And so um, I would say online is the best place to go. Um, and then, Andrew, I'll also share with you our direct um, phone number as well for scheduling in case anyone's interested in that. Excellent. And uh, for those that are listening, I'll put all of this in the blog and the show notes that come out with this episode. Um, and Amanda, thank you so much again for taking some time with me today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Oh, 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 oh,